Hello. Today we're going to be talking about mood disorders, both depressive disorders and bipolar disorder. As you are probably already aware, mood disorders are the second most common of psychological disorders. The first, of course, being anxiety disorders, and the third being substance use disorders. In beginning to consider mood disorders, it helps for us to think about the difference between depressed mood and mania. We can all relate to depression fairly easily because everybody gets depressed at one time or another. We have those times when we feel down, blue, low, discouraged, where maybe we're dragging and it's harder for us to get things done. But fortunately, these periods are usually only temporary and uh, mild in severity. However, sometimes uh, the depression will be more severe to the extent that it can be even incapacitating for an individual where they experience distress and dysfunction associated with their depression. Of course, the same thing can happen with mania, a mood state that exists at the other extreme. What Comer, the author of our text calls breathless euphoria. It may be a little more difficult for many of us to relate to the state of mania Yet, when someone is manic, it can cause major difficulties in their life. When in a manic state, a person oftentimes finds their thoughts to, to be very rapid. Their mood becomes elevated, expansive. They may be more quick to anger. They may be more likely to engage in impulsive behavior such as uh, shopping, spending a lot of money, uh, sex, drugs. They tend to have grandiose thoughts and an exaggerated sense of their abilities when they are in a manic state. On the one hand, a manic state can be rather intoxicating because the person enjoys feeling that way. But on the other, they may be inclined to engage in uh, self-destructive behavior and behavior that might even be harmful to other people. Depression can be either unipolar or bipolar. In the case of unipolar depression, the person has episodes of depression interspersed with more normal states of mood. And of course, in the case of bipolar disorder, which used to be called manic depressive illness, the person has periods of depression alternating with periods of mania or hypomania, hypomania being a low mania. In thinking about unipolar depression, basically there are um, two main types of unipolar depression to consider one is what's called major depressive disorder, and the other is called persistent depressive disorder. Interestingly, with regard to major depressive disorder, you'll note as you learn about this disorder in our textbook, that the symptoms of depression only need to be present for two weeks before you can make the diagnosis. This is the shortest duration criterion for any disorder as far as I know. But the person needs to have several symptoms of depression, I believe it's five, that need to be severe enough <clears throat> to interfere with their functioning and cause them distress. Among the symptoms that someone might experience who is depressed clinically uh, is suicide. 
along with several others you'll see. And in our next chapter, our entire focus will be on suicide. The other kind of mood disorder that uh, might be experienced is what's called persistent depressive disorder. In this case, the depression may be of a more severe variety that lasts over a longer period of time, or it might be somewhat of a milder variety called dysthymic disorder that in adults needs to last at least two years and in children and adolescents one year before you would make that diagnosis. There are a number of ideas about what might what might cause a unipolar depression. And when we think about it from a biopsychosocial perspective, uh, it leads us in the direction of considering several different possibilities. In thinking about uh, the biological explanation of unipolar depression, of course, one prominent idea is that um, unipolar depression results from an undersupply or may result, we should say, from an undersupply of serotonin, norepinephrine, or both of these neurotransmitters. So when someone is prescribed medication for depression, if it's the newer generation of antidepressant drugs called selective serotonin or selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, these medications uh, seem to work, at least in part, in the brain by blocking the reuptake of serotonin and or norepinephrine at the synaptic, uh, in, the, in the synaptic spaces in the brain. It takes about two to three weeks for the medications to begin working, uh, allowing for a gradual buildup of neurotransmitters in the brain. And this seems to help then to regulate mood and emotion. Understanding this mechanism of action can be very helpful for someone who's taking the medication or if you're a professional and working with someone on medication, it can help to explain this mechanism of action to them so that they can hopefully be patient and give themselves time to see if the medication is going to work. There are uh, several interesting ideas about what might uh, be going on with uh, unipolar depression from a psychological and sociocultural perspective. Uh, one that I would like to talk with you about a little bit today is the cognitive perspective. The idea here is that when people get depressed, they may be inclined to think in a pessimistic way about their lives. And when things go wrong, they may be likely to blame themselves and to think that it's never gonna get better and that it's not just one area of their life, but all areas of their life where things are not going well and where likely they feel a sense of failure. If this is part of what's going on with someone who's depressed and they become involved in cognitive behavioral therapy, the emphasis there will be on helping them to learn how to think about themselves and their life in a more realistic way. One person who has explored this area and written about it is Aaron Beck. In fact, uh, one of your videos this week, I believe, is one of Aaron Beck working with a woman who's depressed. I'll be interested in your reactions to this video in which he's taking a cognitive behavioral approach. But Aaron Beck has this helpful idea of what he calls the cognitive triad. So he believes that people who are depressed uh, see themselves as worthless, their futures as hopeless, and their life experience as unrewarding. So in his work with depressed individuals, 
among other things, he will explore these three areas, self, world, and future, and the person's uh, thinking about each of these areas of their life in an effort to help them to begin to uh, think about their life and their experiences and themselves, hopefully in a more realistic way. Another approach to treating unipolar you know, depression from a, from a psychological point of view that I really like and have found helpful is what's called interpersonal psychotherapy. The idea here is that when we become clinically depressed, oftentimes what's going on in our interpersonal lives that is in our relationships with people become very relevant to understand and work with in the therapy. There are four different areas that an interpersonal therapist might explore. Uh, one of these is um, interpersonal loss. Another is interpersonal role changes. A third is interpersonal conflict, and the fourth is interpersonal deficits. Let me go back to interpersonal role changes just for a moment to explain that one. The others are pretty self-explanatory, but this one has to do with uh, role changes that occur throughout our lives, uh, like say a mother has children and she's raising at home, and they're, they've grown up now and they're out on their own, they've gone off to college. So she finds her role changing, or say a woman who's worked uh, her entire life and now she's ready to retire. And here she sees her role changing. Or let's say uh, a, a young man finishes college and gets married, and now he has a new role in his life of being a husband. All of these are examples of role changes, which can be accompanied by growth and uh, positive aspects of change, but sometimes they can be difficult and stressful as well. But all four of these are areas that might be explored in working with somebody who is depressed. When we think of depression from a sociocultural perspective, another um, interesting finding is that women are about twice as likely to be diagnosed with unipolar depression than men. So people have wondered, why is this? And I would like to ask you to consider that question too. Why do you suppose it is that women are more likely to be diagnosed with unipolar depression than men? And unipolar you know, depression, of course, is diagnosed more often in general than is bipolar disorder. Well, there's an interesting discussion of this finding in your book, and um, I look forward to your having a chance to read that and give that some consideration. I will share with you uh, one notion uh, about this question or answer to this question that has been looked at, and that is people have wondered if the difference in the diagnosis of unipolar depression in, in women might be hormonal. And the answer to that question is probably no. It's probably not due to hormonal differences between men and women. Of course, women can experience mood changes uh, relative to hormonal variations over the course of a menstrual cycle, but we're not talking about depression at that level of severity or that lasts only a brief period of time. We're talking about more severe depression, clinical depression, and they, that tends to be much more disruptive in a person's life. So people have looked at things like uh, the added responsibilities that women have on their shoulders, the multiple roles they try to balance in their lives, 
uh, they've looked at how women place great emphasis on the quality of their interpersonal relationships and also perhaps having more of a feeling of responsibility for the happiness of those around them and how these factors might have something to do with the, um, in the difference in the, the number of women who are diagnosed with unipolar depression versus men. Of course, it might also be that women are more willing to admit that they are depressed and also to seek help for it. But you'll have the opportunity to explore that question um, through your reading and, and reflecting on, on it in this chapter. Another interesting approach to understanding and working with depression that's of a psychological nature is to approach it behaviorally. And in our chapter, you will have a chance to learn about the work of Lewinson and his idea that when we become depressed, one of the things that may happen is that we experience a decrease in rewarding, pleasurable activities in our, in our lives. So part of the challenge there is to help people to begin to engage in activities they once found enjoyable, even if they're not finding them enjoyable yet, since at one time they did, and perhaps it makes a difference when you made a difference then, it may make a difference again if they can engage in these activities. So, uh, Part of the challenge there is for the person to push themselves to do things they used to enjoy, uh, even if they're not enjoying them at the present time. Or as some people say, to act as if I like it until I start to like it again. Bipolar disorder is uh, one of the more uh, devastating of the psychological disorders because of the extremes in mood that an individual can experience when they're in a bipolar state. And it's a great challenge for the client and for those trying to help the client because they, the person who has bipolar disorder doesn't necessarily want to give up their manic states, their high states. They like how that feels, yet eventually they hopefully come to realize how destructive they can become when they are in a manic state. I remember reading a story once about a young man with bipolar disorder. And in the case of one weekend, he spent $30,000 of his parents' savings on recording equipment because he wanted to open a studio in his, uh, the basement of his parents' home where he would have famous artists come and record their music. One of the things you'll you'll notice when you read about bipolar disorder is that there's actually two kinds of bipolar disorder. Bipolar 1 and Bipolar 2. Do you know the difference between these types of bipolar disorder? Well, one thing they both have in common is alternating periods of depression. But the way in which they're different is that in Bipolar 1 disorder, the manic states are more severe. Whereas in Bipolar 2 disorder, the manic states are milder. Uh, what is often called hypomania. And thinking about uh, causes of bipolar disorder, it is one of the, dis of the disorders where biological factors loom large. All we have to do is look at genetic studies and realize that if you have bipolar disorder and you're, you are an identical twin, there is almost a 50% chance that your twin will also have bipolar disorder. And people now realize that the treatment of bipolar disorder needs to include 
the use of mood stabilizing medications. The one that's probably probably been around the longest is lithium. Yet there are still other mood stabilizing drugs that are used and these are discussed in your chapter. Because it is hard for people with bipolar disorder to uh, accept their diagnosis oftentimes and to comply with treatment because they don't want to give up their highs, oftentimes it can be very helpful to combine psychotherapy with medication so that the person can learn how to live with their bipolar disorder and do everything possible to help themselves to not have to keep going through the extremes of mood that characterize that disorder. When we combine the two kinds of therapy together, medication and psychotherapy is called ad Adjunctive, A D J U N C T I V E therapy. You'll have a chance to read about it in your book. So, I wanted to, to tell you about one particular individual who is well known as a world renowned expert on bipolar disorder. Her name is Kay Redfield Jameson. In fact, you have a video about her that you can watch this week. Kay Redfield Jameson is uh, one of my professional heroes. I've never met her, but I greatly admire her. I've written some of her works. She's a clinical psychologist by training and a professor at Johns Hopkins University. She wrote a book a memoir about bipolar disorder called An Unquiet Mind, describing her own personal experience with the disorder as a young woman. I would highly recommend that book, An Unquiet Mind, to anyone who is interested in learning more about bipolar disorder. It is well written and a fascinating book. She found herself uh, engaging in reckless behaviors when she was in a manic state and almost lost her life, but eventually was able to get the help she needed. And through medication and therapy, it turned her life around and allowed her to live an, a productive, amazing life in which she's helped countless people all over the world to better understand bipolar disorder, as well as suicide, and uh, to hopefully get the help that they needed. So I'd like to share with you a quote from her book to emphasize the importance of both medication and psychotherapy in the treatment of bipolar disorder uh, in concluding uh, this discussion about mood disorders. These are Kay Redfield Jameson's words. Manic depression distorts moods and thoughts, incites dreadful behaviors, destroys the basis of rational thought, and too often erodes the desire and will to live. It is an illness that is biological in its origins, yet one that feels psychological in the experience of it. An illness that is unique in conferring advantage and pleasure, yet one that brings in its wake almost unendurable suffering and not infrequently suicide. No pill can help me deal with the problem of not wanting to take pills. Likewise, no amount of psychotherapy alone can prevent my manias and depressions. I need both. It is an odd thing owing life to pills, one's own quirks and tenacities, 
and this unique, strange, and ultimately profound relationship called psychotherapy.